I just want to welcome everyone who has arrived so far, and it's really delightful to see Adam for the first time um, since he's arrived at SOAS in my case, so good morning. And, and really to thank Angelica Van and Mahesh for a most extraordinary collaboration, which we're really looking forward to engaging with all of you uh, today. This is our launch event for a new partnership between UKZN and SOAS. And um, it's been a team effort all the way through and the engagement and participation is really just inspiring. So we're looking forward to uh, talking to you all later today. I can only I can only echo what Kaya said, um, and Kaya said it was a team effort, and it certainly was. But it was um, not an equal team effort. I think we all have to say that the great bulk of the work was done by Angelica. So this really wouldn't have happened without Angelica's um, input. Um, and um, just to say that I'm really very pleased that we have this collaboration with our colleagues in South Africa. I forget when it was when we first met Mahesh and. Uh, a couple of years ago, um, and she came to us and we met uh, on campus, um, and uh, Mahesh spoke to us about um, putting forward um, or creating some kind of collaboration between ourselves and the University of KZN, um, and at the time we certainly didn't kind of know, you know, where it would go and exactly what we had in mind, and we spoke about doing student and staff exchanges and so forth, but we decided on this um, format uh, to launch our collaboration. We certainly hope that this is the first of many. So welcome everybody. Thank you, uh, Wayne and Kai. Um, I would now like to uh, formally open the symposium and welcome our uh, director and deputy vice chancellor to, to start, off, start off. We're starting with Professor Adam Abib from SOAS. Uh, who's going to say a few words of welcome. Thank you, um, Adam. Um, over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Angelica. It's really lovely uh, coming to South Africa from London. Uh, it's one of my first public engagements, at least, uh, or at least my second with colleagues at the African continent. Uh, you know, when, when uh, kind of directors or vice chancellors are invited to open symposiums, they often have a scripted uh, brief, and that scripted brief is often done by organizers, and Angelica has, has done so very carefully. And I'm going to uh, formally say that it's important to recognize that this uh, conference, which I'm welcoming all of you to, in con contested spaces, epistemic uh, symmetries, mobility, and identity, really uh, emerges out of an MOU between SOAS and uh, UKZN. Uh, but I'm going to go off script once I've said that. Uh, so forgive me, Angelica, and say for me that it's a particularly special occasion. You know, UKZN is a, a, an alma mater in many ways. It is the institution that I studied my undergraduates in Peter Maritzburg. And uh, my master's. And it is also the institution, ironically, that I did started my academic career at the University of Durban Westmore. And I launched the Center for Civil Society some 20 years ago at, at, at UKZN. So it is an institution with particular uh, attachment to me. I was a union activist there, I was a political activist. And so in many ways, it's a very special institution. And I cannot think of a better institution to have one of my early engagements with in South Africa. So thank you, Angelica and uh, Kai and Mahesh and Vivian and Warren and uh, Wayne and all of you for, for facilitating this. Uh, I also want to say a second thing, which I think is important. And that is that I think we in a, a new historical moment. And in this new historical moment, in a way more profound than any other, our challenges are all transnational in character. I think this, this pandemic demonstrates this more than anything else. But it doesn't matter what you take, whether this pandemic or climate change or energy or inequality or social and political polarization, those are transnational challenges and they require transnational solutions. And to be able to have transnational solutions, 
you need institutional capacity and human capabilities across the world. And the fear I have is that our partnerships for many years, 20, 30 years, we've had many global partnerships, but in effect, those global partnerships have undermined the development of institutional capacities and human capabilities. Those have been profoundly unequal partnerships. And more importantly, what they really were about was identifying, and I know there's an irony in Adam Habib saying this, there's, uh, we, it was about identifying talent, student talent, and bringing them to London and New York and Beijing and Berlin, and weakening institutional capacities in that regard. And it seems to me that we've got to reimagine in this historical moment, not a completely higher education, the digitized technologies enable this, but we need the political will in universities to enable this. And so we've just launched a new strategic plan at SOAS. And it's just been, or at least the first elements have been, have been through its board of trustees. And at the heart of the strategic plan is a new internationalization strategy. And that internationalization strategy says this. It says our challenges are transnational and we need to move to co-curriculation, co-credentialing, co-teaching. And so as wants to pioneer this model in a financially sustainable way. But we're also quite keen on establishing research centers that we are, and we're arguing that some of that will be in, you, in London, but you can't, you can't think through and write about and reflect on and understand the planetary questions of our time through the lens of Africa, Asia and the Middle East from only London. And so we're thinking about partnering institutions in South Africa and the rest of the continent and in Asia and in the Middle East, five, six, seven selected partnerships to build co-finance, co-build research institutions that teach our students both in UKZN and in, in SOAS, that do joint research in a real sense, that co-partner and co uh, and co-organize. And ironically, it allows institutions in these countries to compete for UKRI grants through the SOAS link, because you will be co-owned and co-partnered. So it's a fundamental rethink of how we're going to do partnerships. And in part, we think partly because we're small partly because we're in London, partly because we've got a mandate that speaks to SOAS, I mean, to Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. We can be a progressive disruptive influence for higher education in the UK and the world. And it's something that we, we're thinking through quite profoundly. We're right at the beginning stages of it. And so in a sense, uh, what is happening, Mahesh and Vivian and Wayne and Kai, and Angelica, you pioneers, if you like, in imagining a new partnership, in imagining uh, a reimagination of higher education itself uh, in many ways. Um, and we, I must say, I'm quite keen on this and I'm particularly keen and attracted to the fact that it's happening in conversation with UKZN, where I began my academic trajectory and I began my student life. So, um, I tend to go on, uh, colleagues. I'm going to shut up at that point and give Inshlanschlan an opportunity to speak. Uh, I wish I will listen to Inshlanschlan, but at some point I might have to sneak off. So forgive me for that. I wish you all of the best in this deliberation. And hopefully at some point we can do this face to face, perhaps in South Africa and hopefully in London. Thank you very much. And I, I wish you the best of deliberations in the coming days. Thank you. Many thanks. Many thanks, Professor Abib. Um, very um, inspiring welcome. Thank you. And I pass now to Professor Mkise to say his welcome from UKZN. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much, Program Director. And also, thank you very much, Prof. Adam Habib, for those good words of introduction. I would like to begin by addressing uh, Prof. Adam Habib, the director of the School of Oriental and African Studies of the University of London, and of course, our friend 
and his entire delegation from SOAS, our keynote speakers and friends, Professors Mbembe, Nyamjo, Lewis, Hamilton, and Rasul, Professors Ojong and Naidu in their respective capacities in the School of Social Sciences, members of the university management of both institutions, members of the academic community, the Student Representative Council, fellow academics, students, and all lifelong learners globally. Ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. I welcome you all on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Nanapogo and his executive. The theme of this symposium is decolonizing knowledge, a timely and necessary, but also a complex undertaking. How can we restore marginalized ways of seeing and knowing without taking cognizance of the dialogical interpenetration, incompletion, and indeed the interaction of all knowledges throughout human history. For some, the endeavor will be a form of restorative justice, for others, perhaps a means of enriching our lives, akin to restoring ecosystem diversity. Still others believe that decolonizing knowledge will enable new and more beneficent forms of social, economic, and political organization. The potential is vast, but we can only realize it through painstaking work. It will, of course, include the slow, deliberative process of reckoning with our past and what we have come to accept as our histories. Predictably, it will also open up debates about what comes as knowledge and how we communicate and work with the rest of the human community and the rest of creation and other life forms. We might also have powerful insights into other ways of apprehending the physical and social worlds with a bearing on how we begin to address the perennial question, how shall we live? And what is the relationship between us beings presumably endowed with superior intelligence and other life forms? but there are risks as well. It can be quite difficult to tease apart and excise the pernicious and limiting elements of legacies from those that have demonstrable benefits. It would, for example, be perverse not to applaud the astonishingly rapid development of vaccines against the COVID-19 virus, to which UKZN has made a substantial contribution. I have in mind as well the unfortunate and ideological positioning and distortions of the great knowledge traditions that we inherited from the Nile Valley civilizations as part of the African and human community to further some myopic patriarchal interests. At the heart of all of this, therefore, is our positionality, the telling of this great human story and the vantage position from which this narrative is told. Above, I have referred to the sterling role that has been played by UKZN and South Africa in general in mapping the evolution of the COVID-19 pandemic. We should be mindful as well that there is a vast repository of medical and other forms of knowledge that remain at the periphery of the academy. And it is about time that the logic of scientific analysis, as it was developed by ancient sages such as Imhotep of Kemet, amongst others, is also applied to establish the efficacy of these traditional medicines. I do not think we can delve into these questions without addressing the philosophy of science, the history of humanity, and human ideas in general. For me, the heart of the decolonization of knowledge challenge which has placed universities at its center is this. Can we deploy the tools of evidential exploration and logical analysis to interrogate those very tools, as well as the other ways in which knowledge is generated and validated? And how do we factor in different ecologies of knowledge and epistemologies as we do so? I believe we can do this 
and I say so for two reasons. First, we and our sister universities throughout the continent and indeed throughout the world are committed to the truth, that is to expanding understanding of the physical and human worlds. I believe that initiatives to decolonize knowledge will open up interdisciplinary and even transdisciplinary avenues of inquiry, thus helping us to rid ourselves of the illusion of the separation between the natural and human worlds. Pursuing knowledge in this manner will also facilitate creative and enabling insights into the human condition. Secondly, decolonizing knowledge is not merely a local or a national concern. My point is not only that we in South Africa have much to learn from our counterparts in Latin America and Asia, but that the institutions in what we have come to call the West have their own reckoning to undertake, now widely acknowledged. We have a great deal of thinking and feeling to work our way through, and we can best undertake it in good faith and with a scrupulous care with as many of our fellow academics and scholars as possible. So in the furtherance of that work and more, it is my pleasure to announce that the University of KwaZulu-Natal has signed a Memorandum of Understanding with SOAS at the University of London. This framework will facilitate mutually beneficial opportunities for our students and staff, from scholarly exchanges to research collaborations and community engagement. For all of the universities that are facing for all that universities are facing under the shade of this global pandemic, there are vital research endeavors to be undertaken, made more intellectually challenging and rewarding by our shared growing awareness that the pursuit of knowledge is never free from the weight of human history. It is my firm belief that this awareness will enrich rather than inhibit our work. And it is both an honor and a pleasure to welcome the members of SOAS into closer working relationships with the members of the University of KwaZulu-Natal. In conclusion, Sengipeta Imbenge, Mia Bonga Gakolo, Ibonge Unjingalwazi, Adam Habib, Bokuti Anga Kotwa Izimpandezake, Akubeke Nukutuma Nanati, Ize Esewelele Pesheya, Ibonge Ikaza Ligan Jingalwazi Ojong, Nekaza Ligan Jingalwazi Naidu, Timba Labo, Eko Helen, Lomtimbi, Kanine, Timba, Liga Soas. Is a Kulum is a twist pavile, Siabonga Sangonosa, Kinifisella, Ingunutella, and Impumelo, Nestello, Ezinke. Giabonga, I thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Mkise. Thank you so much for uh, your welcome. And uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Abib. Um, we are now moving uh, to the keynote. Um, we are very pleased um, to have uh, Professor Kilembembe here with us today. Um, you know, we are all very, very thrilled about that. And he's going to be <coughs> in conversation with our um, uh, academic do uh, Dr. Amina Yakin. Uh, thank you so much, Amina. Uh, I will now pass on to Amina uh, to take over the session uh, and introduce uh, Akile Mbembe and also a little bit more uh, about herself. Thank you, Amina. Over to you. Thank you, Angelica. Good morning, all. And um, it's such an honor and a pleasure to be here this morning. As Angelica just mentioned, I'm, um, I'm um, Amina Yakin and I'm a uh, post-colonialist myself and um, chair of the decolonizing working group and um, so as festival of ideas and center for the study of pakistan so it's um lots of things uh, that connect with global um connections and ideas um and i'm um, would like first of all to begin by thanking professor uh, mckesey Pro professor habib um my colleagues, um, Kai, Wayne, and also uh, Mahesh, and, and 
send greetings to everyone at KwaZulu Natal. It's um, this is uh, such an amazing um, collaboration and the start of new journeys for us at a time uh, in which there's not been much to look forward to. So you really have given us something to look forward to in these in these very challenging times. Um, it's my um, also great honor and pleasure as a post-colonialist to be in this conversation with uh, Professor Ashil Mbembe and um, I'll give you an introduction to him and I hope I can do justice in the introduction and I'm very much looking forward to our conversation. Um, Professor Ashil Mbembe was born in Cameroon. He obtained his PhD in history at the Sorbonne in Paris in 1989. And um, he has lots of accolades. He's been in many places. He's been at Columbia University as assistant professor of history, a senior research fellow at Brookings Institute in Washington, DC, and again at uh, Pennsylvania in history at the University of Pennsylvania. He's been an executive secretary of the Council for the Development of Social Science Research in Africa, in Dakar, um, and he was also a visiting professor at the University of California at Yale University. And what I love about uh, Ashil's work is that it's also connected with the university, with public policy and with um, uh, sort of social science research. And he's the recipient of an honorary doctorate from the University of Paris and um, uh, also Belgium. He has also held the Albert Great Chair at the University of Conn. Um, but let me talk to, uh, he's been awarded numerous awards and uh, including um, the uh, 2018 Gerda Henkel Award and the 2018 Ernst Bloch Award. Um, and what we know him the most for in post-colonial studies is as a major figure in the emergence of a new wave of French critical theory who has written extensively on contemporary politics and philosophy, including on the post-colony, which was um, <clears throat> a kind of groundbreaking book, followed by a critique of black reason, necropolitics and out of the dark night, there have been numerous essays also, and including essays on decolonization. His books, originally written in French and numerous articles, are translated in 13 languages. And I think as, as to really be on a global stage, that is something that is very, very important and necessary. And um, he, um, so I, I, again, to say as a post-colonialist, to have this opportunity to be in conversation with um, Ashil on the theme of today's, um, these two days, this two day symposium of contested spaces, epistemic as asymmetries, mobilities, identities, is um, is a huge kind of canvas to chart and obvious and, and a little bit like Adam, we might uh, steer off territory sometimes, but we'll we'll try and focus our conversation as much as possible around the task that we've been given of decolonizing knowledge production. Uh, so, I think uh, already what's been mentioned are transnational solutions, digitized technologies, and internationalization, the strategies within the institutions. And Ashil, perhaps we, I'd, I'd like you to start, um, I, I, before I ask you to start, I'd also like to draw your attention to something that we did here at SOAS that really connects quite deeply with your work. I was involved with um, putting together the festival on the theme of decolonizing knowledge, which we felt was, it was really inspired by your series of lectures and conversation with the Roads Must Fall movement. Um, and in, in those lectures, you spoke about several things from demythologizing whiteness to reinventing a classroom without walls and the necessity of reevaluating a Eurocentric canon so that we may open the door to a variety of knowledges rather than universalizing one particular truth and we dug deep into our institutional kind of work that we do and also the work that I do you know what does this mean for post-colonial studies for the research at SOAS our teaching what kind of real and our uh, sort of 
engagement, our public engagement, and what kind in those relationships, what kind of real world values do we offer? The kind of space you envisage in your lectures on the archive is a very open one that celebrates difference, bringing together a variety of publics in the act of co-learning. Your vision speaks to the kind of that kind of work that we are very keen to connect with and, and that we do a bit, uh, quite a bit of as well. So essentially, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of probably saying things that you've um, uh, repeating yourself to you, but ju just to kind of reiterate this, that decolonizing knowledge is about the acknowledgement and reordering our world from a global South perspective to critically analyze the movement of capital, enslavement, ownership of land, migration, and trying to understand the epistemic violence of history. So I just wanted to put that on the table as, as a conversation that we've been um, having quite a lot of in the autumn. And, and I hope that this conversation is an opportunity to reconnect to it and also to continue in new directions. So I thought the first question that I would ask you that is both topical and necessary uh, is um, what is the impact of the pandemic in South Africa and what are our life futures? And also thank you very much for being here and a warm welcome to you. Okay, th thank you, Amina. Um, you asked me what is the uh, impact of the, the pandemic uh, in, I mean, uh, I imagine on uh, intellectual life in, in, in South Africa and in uh, our universities. I'll just give you one uh, small example. Yesterday, um, we, um, we, meaning um, the Wits Institute for Social and Economic Research uh, organized, um, launched, in fact, its 2021 uh, public positions series. It's a series where people uh, take position on a number of uh, what they consider to be uh, key uh, issues of our times. So it was launched yesterday. This year it has been decided that uh, the uh, public positions series would focus on Franz Fanon. Uh, the title of the series is Fanon after Fanon. Uh, Fanon after Fanon in a context in which on the one hand, finally we have the totality of his work, uh, what he has written about his very short life, not only political writings, but also a psychiatric writing, uh, his literary work, he was uh, also a play writer. We finally have all of that. Uh, Fanon also, at a time when um, we know what's going on in terms of uh, the resurgence of, of racism worldwide. Uh, racism in this age of COVID, since you mentioned COVID, uh, which means in this age when uh, the distribution of risks, uh, in this case, mortal risks, uh, is unequal. And uh, risks affect, or oh, certain categories of people are more exposed to them than others. So, so Fanon is topical uh, in that sense. We uh, put up, uh, using digital technologies, uh, uh, a webinar which attracted 600 scholars, people from all over the world. This we didn't do before COVID. I want to draw the attention to the kinds of new possibilities which are uh, suddenly at reach, at our reach, which allow us in fact to begin thinking about how we could expand the boundaries of the intellectual common. Let's just give it that name. The intellectual common, which I hear, I mean, in what Adam was sharing with us a moment ago, was talking about in terms of a new model of interna internationalization. I would call it a new model of how we constitute 
a global intellectual common. Professor Nanla also uh, evoked it. So it seems to me that uh, in the midst of the tragedy that is going on, there are a number of possibilities which are abetted by the uh, technological capacities we now have, which I understand not at everyone's, uh, uh, not everyone has access to them uh, in equally, but in any case, they are there and they allow us to rethink the world and reorganize intellectual work in ways that uh, can really make, make a difference um, and in ways that are, uh, let's say, in a way that is urgent. It is urgent because uh, there are a number of global developments going on, uh, uh, which um, the concept of decolonization or the project of decolonization has to take up if it is to, to remain uh, pertinent, if it is to be more than just a slogan. Uh, so, so look, that's uh, one way of uh, um, entering into the conversation you're inviting me to enter in, into. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Ashil. If I may pick you up on um, the 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 question of Fanon as you as you brought um, him up um, and the you mentioned the totality of his work and Franz Fanon after Fanon and I'm I'm thinking of the need and the necessity in these times uh, for radical thought and what you think is your engagement with Franz Fanon has been a major part of your work. And where do you think that, what kind of challenges are present in this current moment around radical thought? You know, what are your, what are your sort of um, thoughts on this and the question of community and the concept, this kind of goes back to your work on the post-colony as well. Um, and I have a connected question to that, which I'll ask you after that. But if I can just sort of first ask you to to come in on, on Fanon radical thought and where we are in, in sort of post-colonial studies, in African studies, what do you think are the, is the future for this? I mean, there are so many things. Uh, first of all, a, a paradox that uh, seems to me to be, to be going on. On the one hand, there is an injunction to decolonize, which is coming from almost all over the, the world. Now, if you Google the term decolonize or decolonization, you'll be astonished at what might come up. So there is a, a global injunction to decolonize, uh, which manifests itself in every single discipline. Is not one single discipline in the broad field of knowledge that is not facing interpolated uh, as we speak. At the same time, especially in most, uh, some important countries in the North, there is a huge anxiety emerging in relation to a number of currents of thoughts, thought, traditions of thought, post-colonial studies, decolonial studies, gender studies, uh, critical race studies, uh, debates surrounding the question of intersectionality. Most of these currents of thought or subfields are under assault. They are under assault by not only right-wing forces, but by democratic liberal governments. As I speak, such is the case, for instance, in France, in all countries in the world. Such is the case, of course, in Hungary, uh, and the kind of, uh, my friend Arjuna Padurai calls it, the fear of small disciplines. You see it in India too. 
So that's part of the, uh, the paradox. But I would really like to put on the table a number of key developments I think we have to attend. We cannot not attend. The first one, I would argue, has to do with a changing epistemological landscape. A changing epistemological land landscape, which itself, I believe, is um, uh, the result of uh, uh, technological innovations. Um, it is the result of epistemic reconfigurations or shifts, which uh, are underway in various disciplines and sub-disciplines. Um, they're underway, debates going on in terms of, I mean, what is a data? How do we harness new kinds of data? Uh, how do we reshape what constitutes a unit of analysis? Uh, new bodies of, of thought, I think, which are uh, increasingly involved in rethinking the nature of knowledge itself. We're no longer sure what is knowledge and what is not, what is true and what is, what is not. Um, the nature of, of matter, for instance, um, the degrees of agency um, and the way in which they are distributed across human agents, non-human agents, there are a whole set of uh, debates of this nature which are unfolding. And if we want to be serious about decolonization, we have to be part of those, those discussions. Um, so it seems to me that what we are witnessing, we are in the midst of uh, an intense uh, period of, uh, I would say, heightened uh, curiosity and experimentation. I don't believe, like many, that uh, the humanities are in crisis. Maybe certain sectors of the humanities are in crisis, but not all of them. In, in, in a number of, of others, this is an amazing period of curiosity and, and experimentation. Um, the second thing which we have to put on the table, Amina, mm -hmm. is the extent to which the historic antagonisms uh, between uh, the, uh, the sciences and the humanities, the extent to which they are breaking down. Uh, they are breaking down uh, as uh, a result of the, uh, the gradual recognition that uh, uh, we uh, humans are not at all disentangled from uh, other species. And this is really an important, uh, uh, let's say, development. Uh, so, so we see a renewed dialogue between the social sciences, science and technology studies, for instance, life and biological sciences, philosophy, uh, renewed dialogue, which is uh, uh, in, in, in the making. Uh, for instance, uh, issues that have uh, early uh, been the object of uh, the life and biological sciences are being or are becoming uh, the subject of uh, uh, theories and methods within the humanities and vice versa. Um, this uh, raises all kinds of challenges for the so-called decolonial project. I could go on and on. Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that uh, we have to bring those, uh, uh, take them into account uh, during these uh, conversations. No, I think that's, that's really, uh, there's so many things that you've said there where I've wanted to jump in and say, can I ask you to stop there and just um, speak a little bit more about this? So one of the things that I think is emerging from our conversation is that um, how do we think about decolonial studies and how do we think about post-colonial studies and the intersections and uh, technologies and science 
and data and all those those conversations and dialogues which you mention are hold a lot of hope but at the same time they are also as you mention um in in the sort of background is is the challenge to democracy itself and how democracy is shaping itself for the future and if i can kind of take you back uh, to that question of democratic liberal governments and ask you if where do you see uh, how do you sort of see that in relation to africa and where do you see the precariousness and fissures of african life today and what can europe learn from this Know what Europe can learn from? I mean, Europe is, is is not that keen to learn from from anybody. Um, um, which, which is which is a, a very serious problem. Um, but but Europe will sort it out by itself. I, I hope. Uh, look. I mean, behind uh, questions of democracy, uh, development, quote unquote, uh, in, behind all of that lies an, an even bigger preoccupation for, for critical thought in these specific times. Um, An even bigger question, which has to do, as far as I'm concerned, with, I just call it life futures, the question of life futures. And when I say life futures, I simply mean the question of planetary habitability. The question of our existence on earth. And when I say our, I mean the humans, humans, non-humans, the entirety of the living, if you want. Mm -hmm. Of course, I take for granted the uh, recognition that uh, recognition of the uh, the grounded of the the territorialized reality of our existence on earth we live on earth and nowhere else but we live on earth at a very specific moment a moment when i believe the uh, the complex networks of relations that sustain life on earth, these complex networks are in deep crisis. And it is a, a crisis uh, that is the result of a very specific set of events, all of which have to do with our entry into what some have called a new climatic regime. So the question of the conditions for life to be sustained is for me at the heart of almost everything else. Mm -hmm. At the heart of uh, the attempts, for instance, at expanding our concept of democracy, because democracy, as you know, has been mostly imagined as democracy for the humans, or in fact, for certain categories of the human. What would be a democracy that would be imagined as encompassing more than the human? A democracy that encompasses, for instance, other living entities, a multi-species kind of democracy, if you want, where questions of ecology, environmental uh, well-being, the um, 
sustainability of our milieus, climate, animals, all of that is, uh, 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 let's see, taken into consideration. And this is, this is not just an African question, it's a planetary question. So this question of planetarity is at the heart of whatever we might want to mean by the decolonial project. A decolonial project that is nationalistic, that is chauvinistic, that is regional, does not at all address the core of the issue. First of all, the fact that colonialism was a planetary enterprise. And second, the fact I have just spoken about that what is at stake now today is this issue of life futures of planetary habitability. So that's how, let's say, uh, this requires, of course, sort of new research agendas uh, in line with what Professor Landa and uh, Adam uh, were uh, evoking a moment ago. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you. I th um, the planetarity question in relation to the decolonial project is, is something that you've mentioned several times. And I think I'm uh, definitely getting a, a sense of the, I think, considerable amount of work that you've also, and time that you've spent working with development studies as well, and, and work in the development field to that, that sort of it also, uh, I think, informs your work uh, quite a lot in terms of, of thinking of the life futures and how life is to be sustained. And then and then the challenges of, of democracy, you know, that, that we face here, I mean, in, in this country, I suppose, um, uh, I mean, one of the biggest challenges right now we're facing, right, is how the vaccine is going to, to distrib be distributed, to be shared, to be... Um, uh, across the world and, in, in, you know, is it going to be uh, reiterate those differences of global north and global south um, relationships and also the science behind it, you know, what are the ethics and protocols and we've got vaccines that have been produced in different parts of the world and there is, um, there are different ethical protocols for example, with the Russian vaccine, with the Chinese vaccine, with a um, Pfizer vaccine or a, you know, Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. There are lots and lots of questions connected that, that come up in relation to those very things that you're talking about. And, and I'm not uh, going to um, sort of um, put you on the spot with that particular um, to, to kind of chart a way for us out of the vaccine equation. But I'm just wondering what are the conversations that are happening in Africa um, around this and in South Africa around this particular question of um, moving forward out of the pandemic and how do you see the planetarity and the decolonial project making those possibilities more viable or do you see see it more of a, a kind of challenge that that is going to have to be thought of in different ways i mean do you think that that planetarity is going to be possible going forward or or is this kind of the science of the vaccine is that going to you know we're we're being led by this obviously a very important agenda of science that is necessary to our uh, sustainability for the future as humans um, and also we've got this this I mean in this country you know there's a big talk about the leveling agenda you know that we're kind of leveling across the country and class and that's going to be something that's going to be not a factor in in how this is kind of going to be a more democratized project but in reality you know when we kind of explore and see we've seen lots of uh, issues being raised, for example, around the vaccine and the vulnerability of um, uh, Black and Asian populations around that in, in these um, situations, but also the responses to that have been very um, 
interesting and different and they keep recreating those very divisions or or leading us into those very divisions that nationalism has has been very susceptible to in the past in terms of minoritization and an attack on the sort of uh, vulnerable so i i just wondered what what you thought about that you see you see i'm trying to stay away from the nitty gritty <laughs> questions you're trying to get me to to address um okay. um um you see um, in, in some of the circles i i, I interact with um what, what strikes me uh, broadly speaking is the uh, the um, the return to the return of big questions mm -hmm. um which doesn't mean that uh, quote unquote small questions are, are out of the, uh, the picture but but big questions in the sense that uh, they uh, uh, um, almost every single uh, issue we face today is, is transversal. Uh, it, it, it doesn't belong to us. It, it doesn't typifies us uh, either in, maybe in terms of location, but, but it is also faced by many others in many different other ways elsewhere. Uh, this question of the uh, overwhelming presence of the elsewhere in, in our midst. So the return of big uh, uh, questions, but also the return of what historians have been calling of late, deep time. Deep time at a, at a moment when, I mean, uh, our levels of attention, if they are more than 10 minutes, I mean, that's, that's a lot. Time is now uh, calculated in minutes that because of the, uh, the uh, uh, as a result of the technological escalation, uh, time itself has been uh, um, divided, subdivided, uh, fractured uh, to a point where uh, uh, it is uh, increasingly measured, um, um, let's say, uh, along the, uh, the axis of the instant, that, that the speed, speed of time itself, uh, the speed in itself has, is, is um, uh, in danger of abolishing time, if, if, if you want to, to, to put it philosophically. Mm -hmm. that, that time is uh, in danger of being superseded and destroyed and abolished by speed. That, that huge, war that is going on between time and speed. Mm -hmm. So the return to deep time and the return of big questions, most of which turn around the relation of human life to planetary life. Mm -hmm. So when we bring in COVID or vaccines in the midst of this broad picture, what do we see? First of all, and this is something I have been uh, debating with colleagues in the World Bank, I mean, who work on questions of African development. First of all, COVID is not an accidental event. COVID is the result of the ways in which, to put it very simply, we have organized our relationship with nature and other species. The way we have organized our interaction with other species has made it possible for this type of pandemic to emerge. This pandemic has deep, a deep genealogy, if you want. And this genealogy itself is related to, for instance, put it simply, the models of development we have been pursuing over uh, uh, the last few centuries, since in any case, the industrial revolution, which have led to what? The depletion of resources, the extinction of multiple species, terrible encroachment of 
human activities onto the activities of the uh, uh, of, of other uh, species of human. So, so these issues are back on the table. What model of development do we need? Um, how can we, building on our own history location in this place, come up with new uh, emancipatory uh, narratives, which uh, might be of use uh, for, for the world at large. So this question of the world at large is how do we reconstruct it? Is what is at stake in, uh, let's say, the debates on the apartheid, uh, sanitary apartheid that is going on, uh, where pharmaceutical industries come here, do all the tests, use us, our bodies, our organisms as uh, testing uh, dispositives, produce a vaccine which, to which we have no access or can only have access at very, very high prohibitive costs. So how do we reconfigure such a world? And imagine a world in which every single one has a place as opposed to a world where some have a place and others don't. How do we share it? Now the sustainability of our planet will depend to a large extent on our capacity to remember the world, meaning putting back together all its con components and, and sharing it. Uh, so, so look, this is the way in which some of us are thinking about these issues or coming into these debates. What is colonialism? What is decolonization? at a time when uh, two old models of colonialism have been uh, substituted, new forms of technomolecular colonialism, when is the living itself, life itself, that is the object of uh, colonial sub subjugation or colonial forms of extraction and exploitation. So it's these kinds of shifts, if you want, that uh, uh, I personally am interested mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. in rethinking. So when Adam says, uh, I keep referring to Adam because, because he, he, Adam is, uh, he knows how to put on I mean, new, new ideas. When, he, he, when you guys at SOAS rethink what do you call internationalization? What are the epistemological foundations on the basis of which you want to push for this, this new model? So that it goes beyond the signing of memoranda of understanding, which of course I understand that they are important. So it's th these kinds of uh, issues I am personally interested in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Shil, what does internationalization mean in a time of, as I was arguing, incipient convergence between uh, the social sciences, the humanities, life, biological sciences, technology studies, and so forth and so on. And if indeed it is true that we are witnessing a kind of incipient convergence between fields that were somewhat antagonistic, how do we trigger then the development of new research agendas, which uh, might privilege uh, the complex, the, uh, the processual, the nonlinear, the relational nature of phenomena, mm -hmm. which make it such that what's going on here speaks to mm -hmm. and elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so I think what we're talking, what you are talking about very much then is the labor of um, working our way out of the neoliberalism project through the question of being human and who, who we are or re rethinking that question. And I, and I think what I'm 
really interesting interested also to to get more um to ask you more about and i know we're kind of almost at the end of our time and the q a box is absolutely exploding with questions for you so i'm going to turn to that in a minute um are those that in decolonial studies the emphasis on south connections and in post-colonial studies we are also talking about the global south and i um and i'm trying to understand my own kind of um way around this and i i just wondered what is it that we mean when we say south south connections in in terms of um and i know that this is also connects with some some of sort of adam's work and and you know is is also in in a sense embedded in this mou and this relationship uh with um with with sort of these two universities and how um uh, and if i may connect it to in a sense the the very um that that question again you know of of what can europe learn from this in in terms of like how do we um how do you envisage the south south connection i mean i th i think if it's possible just for you to just or do you think it's the it's, it's the viable it, it does what what sort of does it mean to you if, if that's a better way of asking you the question you see, I mean, our responses to questions such as uh, the one you just asked also depend on one, one's own experience. Uh, I mean, my experience has been one of being constantly in motion. I mean, I was born in Cameroon. I left when I was in my early 20s and never went back. Uh, I went to France, studied there for a number of years, moved again to the US, and then came back to the continent, not in my own country, but in Senegal, and then from Senegal to South Africa, and from South Africa, I mean, I've been, uh, it has been a life of permanent unsettlement, if you want. And, and uh, permanent crossing of boundaries or attempts at crossing boundaries as they keep becoming ever more rigid, talking now about a sanitary passport in addition to... Uh, so, so that has been my experience. That's how I think. So categories such as South-South, of course, they are, they are understand the importance and I have colleagues who are really working on these, uh, Dilip uh, Menon, for instance, uh, but not only him, many, many more. But I, I'm more interested in what I would call triangulations. Because although, I mean, the no and we see those triangulations going on, including in the actual experiments, South-South experiments, which are also happening. Hopefully they are no longer only mediated by the North, but a lot of them uh, include those collaborations, include the North. In so far as there is a South in the North. There are many Souths in the North. So, so what are we talking about territories? Are we talking about geographies that are beyond territoriality? Or, or are we evoking imaginaries or, or a world in which networks are reshaped in, in light of uh, the, uh, for instance, the current digitalization of our world and so forth and so on. So, so, so those questions, let's say, um, inhabit me and I don't have a response to them. Um, 
what I know and what I sense is that in an age which we have characterized as planetary, we need, we will increasingly need to draw from the archives of the world at large. That we cannot depend solely on the archives of the North to account for the transformations we are witnessing or experimenting with. And therefore, some way of uh, imagining what a global intellectual common could be is something we too in South Africa, in the continent, have the responsibility to, to think about. We cannot only leave it to others to think about what these global intellectual common, which is in the making, what it would look like and uh, uh, how we can make it such that uh, it doesn't simply reproduce inequalities of, of the past and, and, and the present. Okay, okay. Um, thank you. And, and I think that really uh, responds to a question that I had planned on asking, but I think you've already answered it. So I won't ask, but I'll just, um, just for people's interest, say that I um, had thought about this in relation to uh, Shiel's work, uh, book, Necropolitics, and the idea, the critical response to Michel Foucault's idea of biopolitics. And, and Achille, in the book, you say whether human civilization can give rise to any form of political life at all is the problem of the 21st century. And the book is very both pessimistic, I thought, and hopeful, speaking of a planetary democracy and the demand for justice and reparation. And, and you've just, I think, given us a vision for how you um, are thinking about a global intellectual common as the kind of way forward from, from that sort of direction that you left us with at that point. Um, so I'm, I'm going to kind of pause my speaking there and start picking up the Q&A. Um, there are raised hands as well as questions in the Q&A box. So you know, are you happy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I yes, yes. Me, they're asking me to close the session. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> they're asking. To close okay. uh, as you see, if I, uh, at 10.20, um, uh, no, they're asking me to close at 10.20. So we have uh, 18 minutes for questions. Is that okay for oh, us okay. to do today? Oh. Thank you. <laughs> you're not just saying you're, I've tired you out, I hope. <laughs> to, um, I, um, so what I'll do is Angelica can uh, can we take questions live as well or do we is it just better to take the Q and A box questions? Um, uh, no, we, we we prefer to take the Q and A box. I should, that's okay with you, please. We are not. Yeah, take. Okay. The, uh, I know there are a lot. Unfortunately, we won't yeah. be able to answer them all. Sure, that's fine because I know some people had raised hands. So if the raised hand people can then just stick their questions in the box, we'll try and get through them. So Sheila, if it's okay with you, I'm going to read three or four questions at a time. And uh, some you may have answered already. Uh, so please um, bear with me as we kind of work our way through this. There's a question from uh, Adrian Watson. I'm interested in the panelists' views on the role indigenous knowledges might have to play in drawing on the archives of the world to advance the project of decolonizing epistemology and building a planetary global collective common. So that's that's one question. There's another from Esther Ramani, um, and, and apologies if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, I'm intrigued by Ashil's idea that time itself is being overtaken by speed. In academia, has this not to do also with the pressure to publish quickly, to move away from slow scholarship? Has this to do with the speed of technology, the information and knowledge overload? How can we do intellectual work that respects complexity and the need for more thoughtful ways of making and disseminating knowledge? And Sophie Chohan's question, which is connected, what role do you imagine for the university in the future global intellectual common? Um, and just one more, Celia Zers, before I ask you to, to kind of 
give us your thoughts, Ashil. What is the role of the local and the rural in the global south in decolonizing knowledges, acknowledging the difficulties added by the intersection with class, poverty and the power holded by European educated elites in the creation of knowledge? How to include the local and the rural without patronizing? Um, so would you like to uh, comment on any of those questions, Ashil? Or respond? very uh, complex questions <laughs> I will do my best mm -hmm. um, as far as uh, uh, indigenous knowledges are, co are concerned I, I can only uh, come back to a point I was making early on that the We, the, um, the complexities of, of our times, um, we, we will have to draw uh, from all the archives of the world. Uh, and I use the term archive here in a very uh, philosophical uh, sense. Um, we will have to to, to be multiliterate if, if you want. Uh, multiliterate in the sense uh, that uh, we, we will have to know a bit more than what, what we need. We will have to be steeped in more than one tradition. Uh, let me put it like that. We will have to be steeped in more than one language. We'll have to become multilingual. I use the term language here as a repository, active repository of uh, different forms of knowledge uh, and different forms of uh, imagining the world and inhabiting the world. So that capacity for a multiplicity of forms of habitation, that is, it seems to me, the uh, function, let's say the role of future knowledges. So this question of future knowledges, those knowledges which allow us to inhabit a world that is becoming more and more complex, that is, in which there is no here without an elsewhere. Um, that is a world of concatenations and entanglements. Those future knowledges require the um, require us to indeed take seriously what uh, the. Uh, questioner calls indigenous knowledge. But I prefer, uh, it's a matter uh, that is not that important, to term it the archives of the world at large. The same applies to uh, the last question on the local rural um, and the decolonization of knowledge insofar as it applies to, to all of this. Uh, here, um, in, light, in line with what I was trying to, to say early on, this, let's say there's no, no local today that is not at the same time, non-local. I start from the assumption that all is entangled. There's no city on one side and rural area on the other hand. What we have to look at are the passages, the, the forms of interlocking, because a lot of what is going on, let's say, 
and which is really decisive for the future happens at the interfaces. It hap that's where it happens. It happens at the intersections, uh, if you want. In these spaces of entanglement, which many wants, want to disentangle, which in itself is part of the violence of, of our times. The drive to disentangle what in fact is, is entangled. So as far as, I mean, this local global thing is concerned, uh, re rehabilitation of indigenous knowledges, uh, it, it requires a whole set of moves. It requires the taking seriously of questions, collective intelligence. Um, the, uh, Rehabilitation of, of local memories, for instance. Um, but, but look, um, all of these in the knowledge that these things are in and of themselves the object of contestation. There's no lo local that is not contested. There is no um, indigenous knowledge that is not itself the object of contestation. So there's a political a dimension to all of this, uh, which is at the heart of precisely uh, uh, difficulties we, we're facing. Okay, thank you, Ashil. We are um, for a very comprehensive answer to those questions, and I think uh, very important questions of in indigenous indigenous knowledges and uh, also the multi-lingual multi, um, knowledges that you responded to. And I kind of heard a connect, uh, synergies with Gertrude Spivak's work in your work as well. Um, uh, there are some more questions. I know you might not have time to answer them, but it'll be good to hear other people's voices. I mean, I also have to rush to the airport. Okay. Oh, okay. So would you, do you, are you taking your leave? <laughs> no, I have to take kids to the airport. Okay, uh, of course. In the next two minutes. Okay, so I think. So, okay, all right. So in that case, I think we will um, just wrap up by uh, if I just by I thank you very much. The question on the chat. Shall we I send you the questions? Yes, I will respond to the questions if you okay. send me uh, the questions on the chat. Okay. I'm totally sorry. I have to take two children to the airport. I think that's um, a responsibility that falls on all of us at many times in, in life. So it's it's good to you uh, see you um, taking charge of that. And, and uh, we, who are we to stop you from your from taking your children to the airport? I think that would be very unkind. So um, we will um, I as as Ashil has said very kindly, he will take the questions that are in the in the question and uh, answer box. And Angelica, we will forward them to Ashil, and Ashil, um, if you have the time and if you have the um, capacity, if if you are able to send some responses, then we will reach out to those uh, people who have sent in the questions and and send them out. So it remains for me to to thank you um, and to say um, that it, this has been an invigorating um, and really um, wide ranging conversation. We, it, it feels like we've touched the surface of things that we really need to get deeper and deeper into. But this is only the beginning of this um, KwaZulu-Natal and SOAS relationship. So we hope that we have you for much many more years ahead to continue these conversations and to continue these dialogues. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Ashil. Um, and and uh, we <laughs> so a round of uh, virtual a round of virtual applause uh, for our speaker and um, thank you all very much and and uh, safe journeys to the children. <laughs> Thank you.